Today's video is brought to you by HelloFresh, the meal kit delivery service that will revolutionize your kitchen. Do you ever feel like there aren't enough hours in the day? Look, I definitely do, especially weeknights. It's like you get back from work, it's like, oh no, I gotta cook and all this stuff. But no, HelloFresh take the hassle out of meal time by delivering pre-portioned ingredients and easy to prepare recipes right to your door. No more lines at the grocery store, no more looking for weird ingredients. It's all there right in front of you. Not only is it a time saver, but it's also environmentally friendly. HelloFresh is committed to a cleaner planet and their meal Meals have a 31% lower carbon footprint than the same meals made from supermarket ingredients. Plus, their packaging materials are curbside recyclable in most areas of the US. And that's not all. Their pre-portioned ingredients let you cut down on food waste by at least 23%. And as for taste, well, it's delicious stuff. They've got 40 recipes with over 100 seasonal and convenience items to choose from each week. And the best part, the foolproof recipes arrive pre-proportioned and easy to make in just a few steps. Even if you're not a pro in the kitchen, you can't go wrong. And with seasonal ingredients picked at peak ripeness for quality you can taste, you'll never be disappointed. Plus, HelloFresh's quick and easy meals, like HelloFresh's easy clean-up one-pan Santa Fe pork tacos, or veggie-friendly sweet potato and pepper quesadillas, well, they can be done in 15 minutes. If you're looking for a way to simplify mealtime, try HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use the code BRAINFOOD50 for 50% off. Your first box ships for free as well. HelloFresh.com, code BRAINFOOD50 for 50% off, plus free shipping on your first box. You won't regret it. And happy cooking. Three Mile Island, Fukushima, Chernobyl. Decades later, these names still send a chill down the spine, reminding us of what can happen when nuclear technology is used irresponsibly or pushed beyond its design limits. But while these three incidents loom the largest in the public consciousness, not all nuclear accidents are created equal. The International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, classifies such disasters according to the Eight Point International Nuclear Event Scale, or INES, with zero being a mere deviation and seven being a major accident. According to this scale, Chernobyl and Fukushima are the first and second most serious nuclear incidents in history, while Three Mile Island ranks only fourth. So what then is the third? Well, that honor belongs to a long-forgotten incident in the Soviet Union that killed over 8,000 people, injured countless others, and left nearly 200 square kilometers of land heavily contaminated. For decades, its very existence was kept a closely guarded secret by both the Soviet Union and the United States, meaning that many of the details of the accident remain obscure to this day. This is the story of the Kishtim disaster, Chernobyl before Chernobyl. The town of Kishtim lies east of the Ural Mountains, around 90 kilometers northwest of the city of Chelyabinsk. For hundreds of years, the region has been home to the Bashkir people, an ethnic group of Turkic descent who scratched out a living by farming and grazing the land. In 1946, however, Soviet engineers suddenly appeared in the area and began erecting massive installations of concrete and steel in the middle of the Siberian forest. These were the so-called closed cities, isolated industrial settlements dedicated to a single task, producing plutonium and other materials for the Soviet nuclear weapons program. A dense cloak of secrecy covered these sites to obscure their purpose. The closed cities were given nondescript code names and did not even appear on official Soviet maps. And the workers who lived within their walls were heavily vetted for political reliability and physical health and were forced to swear oaths of secrecy and were restricted from communicating with the outside world. In return, they received better healthcare, housing, and educational opportunities than citizens elsewhere in the Soviet Union. The first and largest of these closed cities was Chelyabinsk 40, also known as Mayak, built 15 kilometers east of Kishtim on the south shore of Lake Kaiseltash. It was here that the Soviet Union built the first nuclear reactor for breeding plutonium. Thanks to a network of spies inside the US Manhattan Project, the Soviets had learned early on the secrets of the atomic bomb, and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin was determined to break the American nuclear monopoly as quickly as possible. This massive effort paid off on the 29th of August 1949 when the Soviets detonated their first atomic bomb, codenamed RDS-1, over the Kazakh steppes, a full five years ahead of Western predictions. But this achievement came at a heavy price. Like the Americans, the Soviets conducted their nuclear weapons program with little regard for the surrounding environment or the health of the local people. At Mayak, cooling water from reactors and radioactive waste from plutonium processing was dumped into open-air tailings ponds, which drained directly into the Teha River, the main water source for 24 villages in the area. Over the facility's 50 years of operation, some 120 million curies of radioactive isotopes were released into the environment, with much of the contamination ending up in nearby Lake Karachay. Even in the 1990s, the lake was so radioactive that swimming in it for a mere 30 minutes would give the average human a 50-50 chance of survival. 
If that wasn't bad enough, the processing plant's smokestacks spewed corrosive acids and toxic heavy metals into the atmosphere. All this, combined with poor safety practices at the plant itself, resulted in an estimated 17,000 Mayak workers being exposed to dangerous doses of radiation between 1948 and 1958. But even this horrific contamination would be dwarfed by a catastrophic accident that took place on the 29th of September 1957. While most of Mark's radioactive waste was simply flushed into open ponds or the river, the hottest materials were kept in a large underground concrete storage tank. As the radioactive decay of this waste generated massive amounts of heat, the tank had to be actively cooled using water. On September the 29th, however, the cooling system failed, causing the temperature in the tank to start rising. The plant staff did not know what to do. There were no emergency protocols in place for such an occurrence, and the plant leadership was absent that day. They would later be located in Moscow, enjoying the circus. As the staff looked on helplessly, the water in the waste quickly turned to steam, causing the tank's 160-ton concrete lid to tremble violently. Finally, as the tank reached 350 degrees Celsius, the lid blew off in a massive black geyser of steam and soot, sending over 20 million curies of radioactivity one kilometer into the atmosphere. Strong winds blew the radioactive cloud across the land, contaminating over 52,000 square kilometers and the homes of 270,000 people. Farmers in surrounding villages reported seeing strange lights in the distance, followed by an ominous black cloud that darkened the sky. Within hours, black rain began falling on their fields. Yet the farmers carried on with their daily lives, oblivious to the deadly radioactive shadow falling over their homes. But then, Within days of the incident, hordes of soldiers in radiation suits descended on the countryside. Farmers were instructed to dig out their crops and slaughter their livestock, which were either buried in trenches or gathered into piles and burned. All this was done by hand, with no safety equipment provided. And once the decontamination was complete, the locals were ordered to gather up their most important possessions and evacuate. 10,000 people in all. But for many, it was already too late. Just a week after the incident, cleanup teams discovered children whose bodies emitted up to 50 ronkins per second, more than 10 times the maximum safe dose rate. Some villagers were measured at 400 ronkins per second, while livestock who had eaten radioactive grass were visibly sick, stumbling about and bleeding from the mouth. Today it's estimated that over a period of 32 years, over 8,000 people died and countless others suffered serious health effects as a direct result of the disaster. But given the Soviets' poor record-keeping and the unpredictable effects of radiation, the true human toll of the Kishtim disaster will likely never be known. Meanwhile, back at the Mark facility, the authorities worked overtime to keep the accident under wraps. The city gates were closed, while decontamination workers and containment vehicles were banned from entering. Plant workers injured in the explosion were sequestered in their own wing of the local hospital and forbidden from interacting with the outside world, as one anonymous witness later recalled, quote, While I was visiting my friend, who was in hospital for a heart condition, I mentioned to her that something unusual was occurring in Yemen Sky. I told her that all the leaves on the trees were completely covered with a fine layer of red dust. Very quickly, all the leaves on the poplar trees became extremely shiny brown, curled up, and fell off. My friend told me that in talking with other patients in the hospital, including the employees, she was advised that a terrific explosion occurred somewhere in the Chelyabinsk Blast. Both my friends and I saw some of the people in this hospital who we were told came from the area where the explosion occurred. Some of them were bandaged and some were not. We could see the skin on their face, hands, and other exposed parts of the body to be sloughing off. The victims of the blast were brought into this hospital during the night. It was a horrible sight. From my friend's room, which was on the fourth floor of the hospital, we were able to see these people walking around on the hospital grounds. The victims of the blast were placed in one wing of the hospital. None were permitted to leave this wing or talk with other patients. Other patients were not permitted to talk with these victims or even visit them. Those who promenaded around the hospital grounds were all by themselves, and the area was sectioned off so that no one could get near them. The cover-up worked, and within months, life at the plant returned to normal, and the quiche team explosion faded into myth and rumor. But the scars left by the disaster on the surrounding countryside could not be so easily hidden. In 1960, Soviet physicist Lev Tumerman visited the area and reported scenes of utter devastation. Quote, About 100 kilometers from Svedlovsk, a highway sign warned drivers not to stop for the next 20 or 30 kilometers and to drive through at maximum speed. On both sides of the road, as far as one could see, the land was dead. No villages, no towns, only the chimneys of destroyed houses. No cultivated fields or pastures, no herds, no people. Nothing. 
But thanks to Marx Reiners and the Soviet state secrecy, the Kishtim disaster remained largely unknown until 1976 when a dissident Soviet scientist, Zhores Medvedev, revealed its existence in an article for the British journal New Scientist. Many in the West were initially skeptical of Medvedev's claims, with Sir John Hill, chairman of Britain's Atomic Energy Authority, dismissing them as a figment of the imagination. However, his story was soon corroborated by Lev Tumerman, who had witnessed firsthand the effects of the accident and was unequivocal about its ultimate cause. Quote, All the people with whom I spoke, scientists as well as laymen, had no doubt that the blame lay with Soviet officials who were negligent and careless in storing nuclear wastes. Two years later, declassified CIA documents revealed that the United States had also known about the Kishtim disaster from almost the very beginning, thanks to aerial photographs taken by the high-flying U-2 spy plane. Indeed, the May 1, 1960 U-2 mission that ended in CIA pilot Francis Gary Powers being shot down over the Soviet Union was aimed at capturing photographs of the Mark plant. Yet the US government chose to withhold evidence of the disaster from the American people for reasons that remain obscure to this day. One possible reason was suggested by American activist Ralph Nader, who in a 1978 interview speculated, quote, "...absent any other reason for withholding information from the public, one possible motivation could have been the reluctance of the CIA to highlight a nuclear accident in the USSR that could cause concern among people living near nuclear facilities." in the United States. But as the years passed and the Soviet Union collapsed, more and more information became available, allowing the full scale of the disaster to be revealed and the IAEA to rank it as the third worst nuclear accident in history. What was it? In 1982, physicists Diane Soren and Danny Stillman of the Los Alamos National Laboratory published a report in which they cast doubt on the traditional narrative of the Kishtim disaster. In fact, they argued that no such disaster ever occurred. Examining official Soviet records and photographs of the Mark plant, Soren and Stillman found very little convincing evidence that a single catastrophic explosion of an underground waste storage tank was the cause of the widespread radioactive contamination in the area. One particularly suspicious piece of evidence the authors pointed to were the numerous reports of reddish-brown dust settling over the land and the rapid death of vegetation that followed. Given the geology of the area, which is rich in reddish-brown clay, this dust was most likely not from an underground waste storage tank, but rather the beds of above-ground storage ponds, which often dried out in the summer, allowing contaminated dust to blow across the land. The rapid death of vegetation is also inconsistent with the effects of radiation and was most likely caused by residues of solvents like nitric acid used in the processing of plutonium. Indeed, Soren and Stillman argued that much of the defoliation and other environmental damage observed in the surrounding area was due to acid rain caused by chemical residues vented out of Mark smokestacks. And if there was indeed some sort of explosion, the authors even posited an alternative cause. At the time Mark was built, the American Plutonium Production Facility at Hanford, Washington, was experimenting with a new plutonium separating process using the chemicals ammonium nitrate and hexane. While this process was never officially adopted, it is possible that the Soviets learned of it through their spy network and began stockpiling these chemicals at Mark. If stored improperly or flushed into the same waste storage pond, these two chemicals could have formed a type of explosive similar to ANFO, which, had it accidentally detonated, would have thrown up a large plume of waste-contaminated clay from the bed of the pond. But if no explosion occurred, or the explosion was much smaller than reported, then why did Soviet troops suddenly descend upon the area surrounding Mark to burn crops and houses, slaughter livestock, and evacuate farmers? Well, according to Soren and Stillman, this is standard procedure even in the United States when excessive contamination is detected, even if that contamination occurred over years instead of days. It simply took the Soviets nearly a decade to realize the full extent of the environmental and health disaster surrounding the Mark plant and finally take action. In the end, Soren and Stillman concluded, quote, the Soviet the Soviets managed to contaminate the Tetra River Valley without any help from such a catastrophe. They successfully, albeit rather unsensationally, created a contaminated area near Kishtim through carelessness and blatant disregard for their people or their surroundings. Today, Marg no longer produces plutonium, though it still operates as a reprocessing center for spent nuclear fuel. And though decontamination and reclamation efforts were begun in the early 1960s, a nearly 180 square kilometer area surrounding the plant remains dangerously contaminated. Known as the East Urals Radioactive Trace, or EURT, the area is officially off-limit and marked by large warning signs. 
Perhaps the only silver lining of the quiche team disaster, whether it occurred quickly or gradually, is that the incident prompted the creation of a research station where scientists studied methods for reclaiming contaminated soil and water and strategies for surviving nuclear war. This research proved invaluable 30 years later when the number 4 reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant melted down and exploded, contaminating 150,000 square kilometers of Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, and precipitating the worst nuclear disaster the world has ever seen.